Um, so what we prepped today is a less marketing-oriented presentation. We're going to talk more about products and technology innovation. That's kind of the theme. It's roughly split between products and offerings that are in the market today. And then we do want to give you a preview on some things that we're working on behind the scenes for announcement later in the year. Um, I'll start, and I'll kind of focus on the first couple of sections. And then I'm really happy that Brad and Chris are going to help me out, and we're going to make it interesting with some demos during the mix. Okay. So let me spend just a few minutes on a little bit of a recap where we are today. I think it's useless to talk about the tech without talking about the customers, right? We've got to tell you what people are doing. We don't solve every problem in the world. We stay very focused on a set of use cases that are a great fit for our solutions. Um, then I do want to talk about performance, and I want to talk about it from a perspective of what we're doing right now in the real world. So I'll highlight a couple of customer case studies that are significant. They've been running with us for a while, and they achieved some pretty impressive performance. And then that'll lead into uh, the help I'll get from Chris and Brad about innovations. Um, so again, I'll keep the marketing to a minimum, but just this is for context for those of you that don't know us too well. We've now been around for over 10 years. So the company started in Paris in 2009. Brad may correct me and say it was 2008. Uh, in that time, we've really focused mainly on our flagship product, and that's the Scalarity Ring. Uh, the Scalarity Ring was introduced into the market in 2010, uh, so it's scale-out storage software. Uh, I think you know the premise, software-defined storage for unstructured data. Uh, innately, it's a key value store underneath the covers. And what we do is we provide a scale-out architecture over the customer's choice of hardware. Uh, the presentations to that storage layer are multiple. Uh, we essentially started with a native REST API, but a notable decision was made in 2013. Um, the market really realized that there were newer applications that were object and REST ready and willing to adapt, but a large class of applications were not. They were still using file protocols. Uh, so a decision was made to not use third-party gateway technology for those file capabilities. In fact, it was to integrate a POSIX-compatible file system into the ring architecture directly. Uh, we refer to it creatively as SOFTS, scale out file system. Um, that is on par with the object capabilities in the system. So that means it scales out in capacity, uh, but it also scales out in performance. So you can create any number of NFS or SMB endpoints um, and essentially get the performance, the aggregate throughput up to the levels of the object store. Okay, so that's wired right in. Brad's been very involved in that. He will talk to you about some of the innovations we're doing on the file system, and he uh, can answer any questions about the underlying architecture as well. We really wanted to keep the innovations rolling. So one of the things that we look back on now is we've done a lot of implementations of various object APIs. Um, Alex and I know that CDMI was one that we all went after for a few, a few years ago. That is supported in the ring still today, and it's actually compatible with the file system. So you can actually write NFS or SMB. You can read it over CDMI or vice versa. Uh, but we did an early S3 implementation back in 2011. We then decided in 2016 that it had to be modernized. Okay? And what we offered at that time we called S3 Cloud Server. Uh, that's essentially a way to provide an S3 endpoint, and we offered it into the open source. Okay? Um, and now we go forward with multi-cloud data orchestration and uh, offerings that solve those problems. A little bit of a characteristic of our, some of our customers. Think about it as roughly half large enterprise, half service provider. Um, and then the mix of protocols tends to be about half and half as well. So we, we look at the stats. 50% uh, of the customers are on file, 50% on object, but quite a few of them use both. Okay, that's one of the selling propositions. Uh, what we've seen very recently is this one. This is the growth for us. Medical uh, use cases like medical imaging. The ring is used as a, an archive for PACs and vendor-neutral archives, uh, that is still a very file-centric use case, fi file-centric workload. The uh, app vendors like McKesson and GE and Fuji, what do they use? They use SMB. Okay, there's a couple of them that have jumped to S3, uh, but we're seeing a lot of growth there, and we sit behind those applications on a file basis. Okay, um, so where do we fit into the landscape? So we are purely focused on unstructured data. Okay, that's our problem to solve. We don't do structured data. We don't do block. We don't do databases. What we solve is the big data storage for files and objects. Uh, there's a variety of different types, obviously a huge variety. 
Uh, but the type of use cases that we focus on and really get 95% of our revenue from are the ones that you see here. So we're a backup target. We're commonly deployed behind the big backup vendors. Uh, that tends to be the starting point for many of the enterprises. Uh, in media, we're used as an archive, a nearline archive for media, but more commonly as the origin server for content distribution. Um, we do have the performance to deliver high aggregate throughput uh, for online content serving, so that's a great fit. Uh, medical imaging, I mentioned PACs and vendor neutral archives. Within the service provider space, what we see is uh, as a service offerings, backup as a service, storage as a service, but we also tend to be the storage vendor of choice for email, for big webmail type deployments. Uh, think people like uh, Comcast and Rackspace uh, deploy their webmail services on us. Uh, more recently, big data. So big data archives for Splunk, uh, for Spark. That's been a, a burgeoning area for us. And then the last one here we call content repos. Uh, we're starting to see solutions for things like NAS offload, NAS archiving. Okay, so again, and I'll just do a quick build here. This animation oh, is going to be a little bit Just a quick bigger. question. Yeah. Do you see, uh, when you talk about uh, a repository for big data, more access via S3 or via NFS? It's a mix. It's a mix. So I would say that the talk is a lot about S3 and S3A, um, but the reality is now we're seeing a lot of Splunk deployments on the file system. Okay, okay. and we do support things like Splunk Smart Store, but you'll see that some of the performance characteristics that we're being asked to deliver lend itself better to, to file. Okay, so it's still, that's a mix even there. And, we, and we've seen Splunk push back on customers who are interested in smart, smart store and say, no, you need to stick with a file interface. Now, why, we don't know, but we've seen Splunk themselves. Well, that, uh, there is one answer, right? And that smart store is kind of designed for, uh, for tiering. Right? And what we're seeing is a lot of applications that need to just ingest a lot of data on a continual basis. And for that, they don't think smart store is optimal. Okay, so we've chosen to use NFS for those kind of use cases. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of the progression over the last 10 years. One of the themes today is multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. We'll do a demo on that. Um, Chris will talk about it. We introduced a product that is a standalone offering for multi-cloud data management about three years ago. Uh, this is Zenko. Uh, Zenko is not um, a ring affiliated product. It's independent of the ring. Customers can license it for use without the ring. So they could use it as a way to manage data on public cloud or on third-party object storage or even on third-party uh, NAS. Okay, so that's a, a choice they can make. We have integrated that technology into the ring itself. What we found is that more recently, a lot of ring customers implicitly have hybrid cloud use cases. So it's easier for them to have it integrated into the ring, part of the packaging and part of the deployment. Okay, and that's something we'll focus on uh, as we go forward to the demo. Okay, um, so what do we see in terms of use cases in the cloud? We've now been hearing from customers <coughs> for many years about what they want to do. And they started coming to us and saying, the system that you provide us works great for on-prem, but we need a way to integrate that data that you're storing with public cloud. Uh, ultimately, start hearing dozens of different use cases. Everything from take my data on the ring and put it in Amazon. Okay, and then you start hearing, well, actually, I need to put it in two clouds. Okay, and sometimes you'll hear, I actually need to bring the data back from the cloud, repatriate it, put it back on-prem. Um, what we decided to do was really focus on the common themes. And the common themes that we hear in hybrid cloud are the three that you see here. Uh, one is data ages on-prem. I need to put it somewhere more cost-effective or long-term. Cloud archiving, right? They'll do something like an Azure cold store or a Glacier. Uh, that's one of the use cases we need to solve. Uh, the lead customer that we really worked with very tightly uh, was more interested in using services in the cloud, so they had to move data to those services. Okay, and you'll see the example. I'll talk about it in a couple of minutes. It's really media-oriented, so they wanted to use the compute power in the clouds for media transcoding and also for content delivery. They wanted to use the native services. Okay? Uh, the one that seems to be a lot of conversations now and more of the recent deployments is this one. Keep a copy of my data on-prem and keep a synchronous copy in the cloud for uh, disaster recovery purposes, for business continuance reasons, okay? That can either be with the app in the cloud, but some of the conversations are just about keep the data. Just make sure that I have another copy of the data. Okay, so cloud, cloud disaster recovery. As an example of that one, here's a customer example. Um, this is a biopharma company in Boston, Massachusetts. 
Uh, they're very interesting. Unfortunately, I can't mention the name. Uh, Tina would get mad. Um, these guys do genomics research for diabetes. They actually have multiple data centers. They have Boston and then they have San Diego. What they wanted to do was modernize the research infrastructure. So what they had was EMC Isilon X and EMC Isilon NL on-prem. So this is the on-prem piece. They now modernized that by selecting the Weka.io matrix file system. So that's the high performance file system cluster. I think many of you know Weka, Weka's offering. It has an S3 capability to talk to an object store. It's not just the archive, right? It's really using it for its storage. This is kind of the cache and this is the storage. Um, what we've done then is they decided to go to a cloud infrastructure for the DR site. So they selected Amazon for that. What we do is we run, first of all, they have Weka's virtual edition in the cloud. So they have the app infrastructure also duplicated. Uh, this is Zenko. Zenko's running in EC2. And what it's doing is asynchronously replicating the changes from the ring into S3. Okay, so that gives them the app and the, the data in the cloud for DR purposes. Uh, they really did this because they thought it would get them the DR site quicker. Uh, and number two, they didn't have the full second copy of the infrastructure in, in their second data center. Okay? This is a very prototypical example of the type of cloud DR infrastructure conversations we're having now. Um, one that I can talk about publicly that's a little bit more notable in the sense that it's more forward-looking is Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg has been a customer of ours now for quite a few years, probably three, three, four years. They originally decided to use the ring as their media storage in London, in their data center here, and also in New York. So this is all the daily videos, the broadcast videos, they get stored onto the ring and then maintained on the ring. Uh, the CTO of Bloomberg came to us and said, I have a cloud CDN problem. What I'd like to do is to take all of that data and push it simultaneously to multiple clouds. And the reason for that is what I just mentioned. It's transcode of all these assets into the various formats. And then they wanted to use the native services like Amazon CloudFront and Azure CDN to actually deliver the content to the endpoint. Uh, they use Zenko today to do simultaneous multi-way replication. Okay? It shows three targets, but they're actually sending the data from ring to 17 endpoints in the cloud. So what are the 17 endpoints? They're different regions in each cloud. Uh, they need that for different geographic places on the, uh, in the planet. But really the multi-cloud capability for them was more about having flexibility. It might be that this one's less costly in a certain region, or it might be that this one has a better service. So they wanted to avoid lock-in. And that was really the reason why they went uh, about it this way. We're in production with this. They do you know, hundreds or thousands of files per day up to the cloud. Uh, there's an ability to also tag metadata uh, that Zenko manages across its namespace and then to perform searches on that metadata. That's very important for them in the media world. Okay, so that's a true multi-cloud one, but I think uh, you probably know this is a little bit more uh, forward-looking. The hybrid cloud tends to be the dominant one. Uh, just to give you kind of a classic, uh, an example of what we're seeing in healthcare. So healthcare, it's a multi-use case environment for us, but the first one is this PAX imaging. This is the common one. Uh, so what do we deploy? We deploy the ring behind one of the big packaged applications. In this case, at Temple Health in the US, we're behind the Sectra app. Uh, Sectra sells a suite of tools that do all the different ologies, uh, radiology, dermatology, pathology. Uh, this sits on top of the ring over SMB. So this is a file interface. What we're seeing in the hospitals is, uh, is it's all about availability. Okay, so they need the data to be always there. So we deploy in a multi-site. Uh, in a multi-site situation here. Uh, in this case, it's three data centers. And what that means is we spread the data around. If one of the data centers becomes unavailable, that's okay, the system still uh, retains full availability, okay? So this is quite common, but again, I wanna make it clear that we are the archive tier. Uh, we're working with a number of partners that rep recommend the entire reference architecture. Typically, they'll use something like a vSAN, as the tier one for the, for the images. And then again, that tiers off to us for, for the back end. Okay, so that's a couple of petabyte deployment in that case on, on HP servers. Uh, the last one that may be recognizable to a few of you here if you're, if you're local, unfortunately I can't mention the name. Um, Except it's on the slide. Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. You should have told me. Okay, um, so this is uh, sports here locally. Uh, I think many of you have seen the press from this sports team. They have a brand new stadium. It's state-of-the-art, high-performance networks. 
Uh, what are we deployed for? Initially for surveillance data, so all of their CCTV data goes into the ring. Uh, it's a packaged app from a vendor called FLIR. Uh, but we also see this as a multi-use case uh, opportunity. So they need uh, video origins server storage for their online streaming of the game video. Uh, and I think you've been quite involved in it as well over yeah. the last few months. Yeah, they're also doing uh, Beam backups. Uh, so we're a repository for both the, the CCTV. They've got about 850 cameras around the stadium, pointing both into the stadium and out of the stadium. So the police use it actually as crime in the area. So sometimes they use those, that CCTV footage for crime recovery. Uh, but we're also a Beam storage repository. So there's at least two use cases, a third one coming. They want to use this as an origin store for player footage and from their training ground and other stuff that they do. How many, how many cameras? 850-ish. 150? 800. 800. 800. It's just shy of So it's, it's not concurrent streaming of 800 uh, cameras. So how it is managed? Because 800 cameras pushing data concurrently on a single store, we are talking about terabits, probably. Uh, no, if it's no, no, so it is. It's so. Um, you have to they are low resolution cameras. Yeah, well, so there's two, there's two, de there's two definitions of camera. So there's a, the standard sort of definition, which is HD, that's looking within the stadium and looking outside the stadium. And they're all at, um, motion controlled now. So if nothing's happening, there's no traffic. Okay. So typically the system's relatively dormant all the time, but there's not an event on. But when an event, when 60,000 people come into the stadium, you know, kind of everything lights up. Uh, and then they have what they call bowl cameras, and those are the cameras that are actually looking at the football field itself, uh, and those are much higher definition. And so that all aggregates back to the FLIR system, and their FLIR system is running within on hypervisors and guest hosts on hypervisors. So they sort of do the initial buffering, and then they're packaging up uh, the, you know, what we call the GOP seat streams. And then they get packaged up to sort of four megabyte chunks that get thrown at the ring. So we're, we're very near line. We're not taking the actual camera image straight to the store, because it has to go through some kind of rendering software. But we're taking it straight from the rendering software that's running on hypervisor straight to us. Yeah. So it's a significant amount of data when there's, a, when there's an event running. Um, if you want me to talk a little bit more, they, uh, they obviously built that stadium relatively recently. Uh, as a result, they built uh, three data centers, kind of one each end of the stadium. They have a sort of a data center underground. And then they have their train their um, their office space right next to the stadium and they put a data center in there. So our solution is spread across those three data centers and so they can lose a data center and still maintain their, their production uh, workflow. So it's a pretty sweet solution. It doesn't help win any trophies though, does it? Yeah, and we, we, kind of, we sort of keep saying to them humorously, so when do, we, you know, when do we get the tickets for the game? And sadly, this, I think we know who they are, uh, they, they know the value of their brand, <laughs> and they just laugh. So none of us have got free tickets or anything else yet. <laughs> We're going to beat them on Saturday, Sunday. Apparently, we, there can, you go. we can use yeah. the site for events, so maybe next year. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 We'll pay. We'll pay. We'll pay. <laughs> they know the value of their brand. OK, so thanks, Chris. Uh, in fact, good transition point, because what we want to do now is show you some of the hybrid cloud capabilities that we have. We've also introduced support for third-party storage in Zenko and XDM. Uh, commonly, the request is there's always a, a, a NAS filer somewhere in the mix. It could be Isilon, it could be NetApp. Uh, we decided with Zenko initially to support third-party storage. This is really intended to be broader than just the scalarity ring. And I'll invite Chris now to give us a little flavor of that. Keep it on yours for these two slides. OK. Then it can be easier. And then all right, no mind. problem at all. You might as well stay stood up. Yeah. Um, so, as you are probably fairly aware, it, we have essentially two products nowadays. Um, so we have our on-prem storage product, which we just announced, Ring 8, and then we have uh, our Zenko multi-cloud orchestration product, which is kind of what I'm going to demo here. Um, clearly, from uh, you know, we're all about on-prem storage, and the Zenko product is all about multi-cloud. So it's about sitting in the cloud, orchestrating data movement um, between clouds. And so what we've done is we've taken the Zenko product and we've attached it, if you like, to our Ring product in the form of the a product called XDM. And so that moves our Ring 8 launch with XDM into a, tr into a, pl into a pure hybrid cloud. So instead of just being on-prem, we're now enabling our customers who have significant data on-prem, Tottenham being one, I guess, 
uh, and they want to DR that or they want to move it into the cloud in some way because <coughs> this is, you know, this is what Bloomberg does, right? They have lots of on-prem data, but they want to expose it across the world uh, on various cloud platforms. So the XDM product being attached, or the Senko product being attached in the form of XDM to Ring make, moves our Ring product into pure multi-cloud multi play. Okay. Anything else you want to add? No, I think we can move ahead. Uh, so, sort of a little bit to that, um, what we sort of foresee or I imagine uh, in the future, and it's, we've had a couple of uh, opportunities that are exactly this, they haven't come to fruition yet, our, our deal cycles are usually pretty long, I mean our minimum deal cycle is six months to typically 18 months, because we're talking really hardcore infrastructure when we sell, so this isn't something you roll in the next day, but what we're starting to see is this concept of a, a core storage solution, which is typically on-prem, that's where Ring really sits. Uh, and then we start to attach these kind of um, uh, the, these cloud instances either at the edge of their network or somewhere remote on the network such that they can capture data and they can move that localized data into a storage, into a centralized storage infrastructure. So we're seeing this kind of edge to core dynamic. And the XDM product is fairly lightweight in so much as you can stick it, at, you know, it's, it can be a one server instance so it can sit over a, a small a small Linux box with some attached storage or a NAS or something like that. So it can sort of locally buffer storage, but then the policies will then lifecycle the data up to the central core. And with that, you get the, the benefit of the data being searchable, uh, at, you know, wherever, basically. Um, so obviously, this edge to core is, um, is very critical to where we think it's going. And you start to see, you start to see people like Microsoft talk, start talking about edge technologies. Uh, but obviously, we're also very interested in moving the data not from just our core, but then using the XDM properties to potentially move it out as a DR to, yeah. to wherever. Clearly, I don't understand how you will manage to do it on the edge. That means that you have just, you depart just a gateway on the edge of the platform. So you could, oh. think, of, you could think of it as Zenko or XDM as being kind of a gateway. So it's a small instance deployment on a 1U okay. or something, it might be attached to a, a NAS or something, or even have a local drive and you have many of those sprinkled around on your edge, gate, your edge environment. Yeah. The applications will talk S3 to it, so you need, to be, you need S3 aware apps at the edge, which is where we're seeing things going. And you will deploy it on the HP uh, small cabinet, a small server, yeah. edge server, for example? Whatever. Edge choice. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. I mean, our heritage has always been server agnostic. Uh, we're x86 based, so Clearly, HP is one of our biggest partners, but we have many partners. I'd say today that you were agnostic, but um, certainly there is more HP server than uh, yeah, others, I, I think which are prevalent right. under Skeleti solutions now. Yeah, I think there's history to that, right? We've, we've worked a very long time with that company. They invested in us a long time ago. So I think there's just a natural a proposition. But when you look across our customer base, we actually have a fairly significantly broad set of servers that we run on. It's not just HP. HP is clearly our primary partner, uh, just because of volume of sales. Um, but we clearly operate across the board. We've got tons of, tons of hardware that we operate on, and it's broadening. And more recently, we're starting to see bigger deals on Supermicro. Yeah, so interestingly, we are in the process of really sort of ratifying that more formally, uh, and because there's a cost equation associated to that hardware that you can't ignore. So we're starting, we already have about 10 customers. What's that? Who handles the support on that? So, uh, so, so. No, Supermicro. Uh, they will. You sure? Level, level yeah. one. So, level yeah. one. <laughs> so the, that's, that's the special point of us for micro. Uh, it's, it's a VAR play, really. Yeah. And so Distribution. We're, we're actively working with VARs to support super micro. That tends to be the, the sales situation is, is, is a VAR that, that has a good relationship. With the VAR will on assemble like a Boston. Like a Boston? Yeah, like yeah. a Boston, but we have VARs sometimes provide direct support depending on the country. But it is, it is a question, it's one of the main reasons, I think it's one of the main challenges of the super micro offer. It isn't, you know, the, the throat you choke is, you have to be clear about who it is. And it, some people have a really good relationship with those people, and, and, and in other countries or other, other situations, it's not so good. It's, it's worth noting that even in our relationships with the HPs and the Dells and Ciscos of the world, when our, our we tend to think of our customers as being 
a little, little bit um, naive sometimes, but they're fully aware of what's deployed on their platform. So when the ops guys see a problem, they know darn well whether it's an HP problem or you know, a physical hardware problem or a software problem. So there's no confusion in who they call typically. Um, it's very rare that we get a call for something that turns out to be a hardware problem or, or HP gets a call that turns out to be something that's a software problem. Invariably, our, our system operations guys, our customers are smart enough to, to understand who to call. But it, it just so happens that they will always call us for the software. And so whether it's running on Supermicro or not, they're going to call us. Now, I think to Brad's point, and this is where we're treading a little bit carefully with Supermicro, is yeah, what happens when the RAID card breaks? Right? Because HP will have four hour you know, repair or next day or whatever. Uh, Supermicro is quite often a ship it back and we'll transfer, right? And they're moving away from that model for good, for, thankfully. But you know, that, that puts pressure on the distributor or the VAR at the, at the end to sort of manage that. Now, we built from the very beginning very, very resilient software. So, the, so it doesn't really matter if the RAID uh, card or the disk drive or a chassis goes down. We don't panic. There's no panicking in, a, in, a, in our systems for you must have four hour support. And in fact, <coughs> invariably, a hardware vendor sell four hour support and we say, why did you buy that? You don't really need it. Next day will be perfectly fine because the ring was built from the ground up to survive that as is Zenko and all the other folks. We, that's our enterprise focus or, or our ISP focus. We, you know, 100% uptime reliability permanently up regardless of hardware. So it's a challenge, and I think it's a water we're going to have to navigate with them. But we do have 10 customers already running Supermicro quite happily around the world. So it's not like this is absolutely brand new for a. And we do have, an, upon occasion, a customer that kind of goes to the very extreme end and says, OK, no support. We buy spare parts. Mm. And, uh, well, we've seen a number of managed service providers do that, but less enterprises. I just ask you quickly about this. Sure. I know you're going to do a demo of it, but just yeah, it's going to be really yeah. geeky. So hopefully, um, but is that is that a single namespace across all of the edge and core components to the extent that I could write something on a device at the left hand side and it be consistent with somebody reading it in something at the right hand side? Yes, if we support the out of band update for the the source uh, on on the edge, and we do that today for Ring, NAS, and very soon for Amazon. Could you say that again, please? Yeah, so I think the question you asked, Chris, is do we see the changes on the edge in the global namespace in the core? Yeah, and, and, and is it consistent? So that's, yeah. say somebody wrote something on one side and somebody else wrote something on the other side, how are you going to do conflict resolution other than last right of wind? Yeah, so it's eventually that? consistent. What we do is we send notifiers from the, the peripheral locations back to the central namespace. We support that today for three external targets, <coughs> NAS, Ring, and Amazon Cloud. Okay. So over time we can do more. What sort of latency do you get on this? I'm sorry? What sort of latency do you get on this? <coughs> if you make, you know, um, do you have set targets for... You can set, you can set parameters for how often you want to be notified. You can set the, the delay. Um, I, I don't think there's anything hard-coded. But usually people are okay with an eventual consistency model on the namespace. So we just... In, in, response to your question. We, we have worked for several years now with the, some of the, the main geeks of the CRDTs, if you're familiar with those, that kind of terminology, uh, just, just right consistency and mm -hmm. how, to, how to do conflict resolution, things like that. Uh, we have an ongoing project doing that on a worldwide distributed file system. Um, all of that research work tends to remain kind of in the research space. We haven't yet found customers willing to kind of get their minds around how CRDTs and conflict resolution works. Um, Brad, we should say, though, that the conflict resolution model today is versioning. But it's, but it's going to be a, right. an, 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 an increasing problem as it, as it, it gets it, more It is, is, and we, have, we, we, under, we work with the people that understand how to fix it, but in the end, the, the fixing of it is, is, is a very complex outcome. Yeah. It's a political issue as well as a technical issue because um, the, the rules around who wins the conflict resolution right. have yeah. to be politics. Right. Right, right. But then, yeah. but then, so Again, the, the current model is that it versions, so it yeah. won't overwrite anything. It'll just keep the older version. Yeah. Then, of course, you've got the complexity of knowing which version it's yeah. be working to. Yeah. Do the wrong one. Okay. Yeah, what we've decided right now is to adhere to the Amazon API. So for uh, replication, lifecycle rules, versioning, it's all emulated through their policies. Okay. okay. So at least it provides an understandable model that people yeah. have used. 
Okay. I, my experience in trying to talk to people about these things is, is it's people's eyes glaze over <laughs> and yeah. I, you know, you can't sell something that people don't understand. It. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Their eyes glaze over until such time as it goes wrong, in which case uh, they wish they had their eyes a bit more open earlier on. Yeah. Could you clarify something for me? Is XDM a separate product? XDM? I mean, it's a separate item on that slide, but... Yeah, XDM is the Zenko engine licensed with Ring. So it's XDM there, we should read Zenko. Yeah, you XDM could. and Zenko are functionally equivalent. What we found is that customers... So what we did with Zenko is we licensed it as a cloud subscription based on usage, total data managed. The Ring customer said, that works for th some things, but I'd rather have a perpetual license with my Ring and have it installed with Ring. No, I'm sorry, I don't understand again. Yep. You've got two separate items there, Ring 8 on the right and XDM on the left. Why? If XDM is part of Ring 8, why is it a separate item? They can be co-located or separate. They're just services. Okay, and why, why XDM? Extended it's not data management, but it's it's the name, the marketing name for the product as part of a ring license. Right. So it's up to market positioning. It, yeah. Does it mean that you need a Kubernetes cluster running on premises to run XDM or Zenko? Yeah. Or or you run XDM in the cloud if you want. That's why but it's it's also a Skoda. <coughs> so typically, oh, no, today, this I don't understand at all. Uh, so. If your customer doesn't have uh, Zenko, uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster, yeah, good follow-up. Let me explain. So, so the, the Zenko or XDM, which is technically the same product, right? It's the same. But product. if you want to have a licensed version of Zenko, part of the ring, it's an XDM. I think so, still so don't get it. Maybe, maybe the simpler way to think about it is this is the storage stuff. server. This fucking this is the hybrid cloud engine. Right? They can be co-located, but we deploy this in a cloud-native fashion. It can be deployed in cloud or it can be deployed on-prem. We chose to go with a cloud-native model. So this is container based on Kubernetes. Eventually, we modernized the entire infrastructure to Kubernetes. That didn't happen overnight. Today, they are deployed separately in that sense because we decided to look forward with, with Zenko and XDM. Yeah. So Zenko and XDM is technically the same product. It's just the positioning of it when we talk to a customer who's and the licensing. And licensing, thank you. So it's technically, physically it's the same product, right? Same code. Um, but when we talk to customers about who are cloud aware and want to exclusively operate in the cloud, we talk to them about this product called Zenko. We don't sell them on-prem storage. But if this is an on-prem storage sale or a customer who's got on-prem storage who wants to move data in and out of the cloud, we sell them what's called XDM, which is technically the same product, but it has a different licensing model. And that's why we did it, to, to unconfuse the licensing model. So when you say and your, that you're... And I want to answer your question in oh, a second okay. as well, which is we also have written uh, a Kubernetes uh, cluster, if you like. We call it Metal K8. And uh, so when a customer wants to run a Zenko or XDM on-prem today, they do exactly what they do when they're running Ring, which is they acquire hardware. And then we layer Kubernetes on top of that and then we layer the Zenko or XDM products on top of that. So, somehow you manage all the stack yes. as a single application. Exactly. Yeah. So, it doesn't mean that when you're going to uh, modernize the architecture of a ring gate with containers, so you will use the same model, and at the end you will have... Common a, stack, yeah. You, exactly. you will provide, yeah, your Kubernetes as a deployment model. Exactly. Yeah. So, our roadmap, so our long-term roadmap is is essentially uh, going more towards Kubernetes. Yeah, and maybe just one more thing. The separation here is the customer's choice. Yeah. And this lets us also size this according to the workload, right? This can be a single server, is or it, it can be a huge cluster, depending on the bandwidth needs to the cloud. complication to the life of the... All right, let's go ahead and move to the so demo. Did you say the long-term roadmap is to re-engineer Ring 8 to be cloud-native? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Already underway for, for quite a while. Okay, Chris, so let's head to the demo. So I think the point of this is to kind of give a flavor of NAS to Ring and Ring to Cloud. Yeah, so data mobility. So there's two sets to this demo, and I don't want to I'll try and unconfuse you. There's two demos. First demo is I have a little NAS running, just an NFS server with some data on it. XDM is basically sweeping that and will move the data to a Ring location. Ring, because I like Ring, so I'm going to move it to Ring. Um, 
And then the second part of the demo, which is kind of unrelated to this workflow, so I'm not creating a loop, it's unrelated. The second part is to, is to discover data. So this would be an on-prem customer who wants to move stuff to the cloud. So I'm gonna, the system, the same system has storage policies that says, look at the ring, see what's there, and if something new shows up, I want you to move it to the cloud, and in this case, we're gonna send it to Azure. Okay, so and two demos. Do this, just to clarify one thing, we don't have to migrate the data to make the NAS data move to the cloud. We can just migrate metadata. Yeah. It's just this demo is having to do it in two steps. Yeah, so there's sort of two stages to this too, which is making uh, XDM aware of the data in its source, and you could just say that, you say, you know, I just, I just want to be aware of the data, so I'm going to import the metadata and leave the data where it is. Because I mean, if I remove something from the local NAS, I see the update on the rig as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you I'll try to show you that. From there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So basically, this is for customers who've got a very expensive NAS, you know, expensive per terabyte. They might have very, very dormant data that they kind of want out somewhere else. We have a cost proposition to move it to the ring, and, they, and there's a secondary cost proposition to say, well, actually, you can move it to the ring and the cloud or just the cloud. Or many uh, clouds. Or many clouds, up to you. Okay, let me hand you the projector, and then we'll come back to mine. Okay. This point of view sounds like, sounds like a hammer surface. There we go. Hopefully that's, uh, I tried to make it big enough that you could see it. Oh, of course, it's got a broken pipe. I'm never going to see that. No. I guess my uh, system went to sleep. So this is a little NFS server, nothing special. Um, I have a bunch of files on it. I'm keeping this very, very simple. Uh, that, the, the Zenko instance is running in the background. This is the dashboard for Zenko. Um, there's such things as uh, storage locations that you define. So you say things like, uh, I have an NFS uh, source. I want to do something with that source. Uh, I have uh, another storage location that says I want to take stuff from S3C up to Azure. You define all these things within a graphical UI. Um, it's fairly, fairly simple. You just uh, fill forms out, basically. And this configures the on-prem system for you. Uh, and then we have a browser within the Orbit interface, and we have some code that you can run locally too if you want to do it that way. I've got that if you want to see it. You can do a little uh, Python or JavaScript uh, search thing. And what this is looking at, so if I look at this, so this is Zenko's view of uh, that file system there. So these are files. This thing's been running a few days, so it's collected these files, and you can see them within, Zen within Zenko Orbit. Um, this data, so, if, so I've got folder three to five, and I've got file list four, four to seven. I was trying to keep it simple. Um, let's just go into here. So the same thing is reflected. This is Cyberduck, if people are not familiar. This is just a, a, a Mac-based um, browser, essentially. And so this is looking at the S3 location, or the ring location, okay? So just to replay, replay this. So that's my source. That's my, net, that's my NAS. Uh, The metadata is pulled into Zenko, so I can browse the metadata in here, and the data is then replicated in the background to the ring. I know it's a little bit geeky, but it's, it is what it is. Three locations, or three views. So um, what I'm gonna do is just create uh, another file, just because just I can. So I've got file seven. Um, it's going to take about a minute because it's a cycle timer that kicks in and scans. No, no, you, you, you already had file seven. Oh, yeah. so, so oh, so I must have deleted it. I'll oh, overwrite it. Let me do eight then. So we'll do eight. Uh, I need to refresh this. It'll take about a minute to do it, but uh, essentially what will happen is we'll. Oh, there we go. That was, that was a quick minute. So uh, there's the file there, and I can download that file if I want. Um, it, so basically, Zenko doesn't have this file. It's not resident on Zenko's or XDM's drives. It just has kind of a pointer to where it is. So if I say I want to see it, it'll download it from the original source, which is the NFS server. And there's metadata associated to this, so I can see that metadata. We, we pick up a whole bunch of uh, POSIX metadata uh, in here. So you can sort of see, uh, you know, we're sort of taking classic POSIX metadata and turning it into, you know, AWS Amazon style metadata. So you could search on this. Um, and then what should have happened in the background, if I refresh this, is that data was pushed, was pulled and pushed over to the ring instance. And there yeah, does that make sense? 
hopefully I didn't confuse everyone. So there's an NFS source, there's Zenko sitting or XDM sitting in the middle, and it's got a replication policy that moves yeah. it to the ring. What, what process are you using to determine that there's been a change on the, the source file system? Um, today we have a sweeper mechanism that's based on our clone, but it's, it's being revamped because it's not, you know, so that's not our ideal end state. Quite, quite performance impacting if you have a lot of file changes on it. Well, and, and more than, more, the thing that worries me most anything, uh, um, being in the architect position I'm in, is I don't want to impact the service on that NetApp, right, by, yeah. by sweeping the file system. And Zenko can, it's a Kubernetes-based system with pods, so you can multi-thread that thing significantly. So when we deploy, we sort of have to work with the customer to ensure that we don't, we don't kill their source systems. But, al but also you could miss stuff, because if your sweep time is... It all depends on the sweep time timers, yeah. ...file and things are going in there and changing and being deleted. Yeah, so we're not... Stuff. It, and that, that's, I think that comes down to positioning, right? Because we're not, what we're not trying to say is, hey, look, instantaneously, whatever changes happen in your NetApp file or, or whatever NFS file you've got, will suddenly appear in the cloud. We're not, we're not talking a completely synchronous system. There's an asynchronicity to this based on timers. But what our customers are looking for is preservation up to a, a cloud environment, or they're looking for offloading to get rid of, uh, you know, to move data, to, to, to release space on a very expensive storage system. And they don't need that to be done. In <coughs> yeah, I'm not saying it's a bad thing the way you're doing it today. I'm just saying that as a customer, you'd have to understand the implications of the technique you're using. Indeed, to indeed. To and that's, you know, down to people like me explaining to the customer. Yeah. And there are more efficient APIs on NetApps and Isilons for... Yeah, for so, so today we're doing something very simple. Within our, within our future purview, you know, when we start talking to Isilons and others, they have things like change logs, uh, and we will integrate directly to those so that we get a change, a change file list instead of sweeping. There's so much more things we can do. Copy the data over when you migrate the data over to your ring system, mm. what metadata is associated with that file? Is it the original creation date and time? Yeah, all of the stuff that you saw in... in That's the positive. All the positive information that was available. So you replicate it, it's not just when you're storing it on the new platform. Yep. And what I could do, I can go into, I, I can if you, we can come back to this because I know we're sort of getting a little bit short on time, but I can, I can edit the metadata within the, the Zenko XDM system so it doesn't touch the source, but I can tag it in a different way. That, so then when it goes to the cloud, it actually has those, those tags or metadata in them. So we sort of enhance the system. User-defined metadata. User-defined metadata. Yeah. Is that almost like using some sort of, um, like a, almost like, I would say a Lambda function, you know, something that's going to trigger off the back of new content turning up or something like that, so you could actually add metadata to it, say the source that it came from or other, right. other sort of things, is that what you're doing? Yeah, it won't be Lambda, but well, yeah. I'm using that as an example. Yeah, just it, well, we, we have, we didn't choose to demonstrate it today, but we do have we do. Uh, a workflow manager that we're working on and will allow you to do things along the way, like tagging with Lambda or other clouds. Lambda, or, or you could do kind of a, a static tag, say this this came from NAS 13. Uh, uh, one of the one of the main drivers that we initially had, um, one of the guys at Bloomberg had a term that I like. He calls it hydrating uh, a, a, a old dried up NAS. Basically, you have this NAS, and you've got this huge amount of data, and you have no idea what's on there. You suck all the data into Zinco, then you can search it by u user ID, by whatever tags that are, that are available, uh, and then make decisions about what we do with our data. And it might be move it to a cloud, it might be move it to a ring, it might be just throw it all away. Or it might be like you process that data as it goes through, Maybe. and you look at the content and say, Absolutely. I want to encrypt it before it hits the, the ring because I need it encrypted, or right. I want to look at it and see that it's a type of object and therefore add tags around it based on the content itself. And um, this kind of gets a little bit biting itself in the tail, but uh, Azure has a functionality um, that, that determines if there's anything uh, personal in a piece of data uh, to, to, to determine is this, is this a GRDP, GD, yeah. GDPR, GDPR. Yeah. I get the French and the, <laughs> and the English all twisted up, but GDP, is this GRDP, GDPR yeah. critical data? Obviously, you have to send it to a cloud, so that kind of that's the bite inviting itself in the tail. But but it is interesting to be able to tag anything that you need to worry about and then send it to a different place. So there's there's all kinds of ideas, and we have this workflow manager that we're working on. Just one so is, on instead of monitoring, mm. you said that you can edit the metadata. Mm -hmm. um,
do you retain the original metadata? Because yeah. obviously, otherwise, auditors will go crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's an additional right. tag okay. or an additional. You, yeah, you, you on probably top. need to explain that slightly differently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, good, good feedback. <laughs> so yeah. the metadata and user extensive. Yeah, yeah. user extensive. Yeah. yeah. So we're just adding right. tags or whatever the limit is on yeah, AWS. It's just when you said edit the metadata, I got a bit. Yeah, we can yeah. we can add additional metadata. Yeah. For that. Well, yeah. Excuse me. That's then searchable. Instead of monitoring an NFS repository, okay, uh, maybe I have hundreds of NFS repositories, can I write a query and uh, just pick up all the data that uh, satisfy the query and build a bucket with it? You can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A metadata query. A, a query against metadata tags. Yeah, but uh, all across my yep. NFS. Uh, yeah. yeah. So let's say you have 10 NetApps that you're accumulating <laughs> that either that metadata into the XDM instance. Yeah, you can query based uh, essentially the, the you can query the metadata that's within XDM and understand where the source is of all your matches. So you say, tell me all the files that have you know I don't know bigger than a certain amount or have a certain file name or have a certain attribute, and then it'll tell you where all the locations are. I'll try and show you that if I have time to. Yeah. So then you can understand what's in your estate. Okay. Um, one thing I just did. I don't know if you saw it. So I. I, I, uh, I did a little trick on uh, on the demo. We said we were going to take it from NFS into uh, into Ring. I actually, when I developed the policy to do it, I actually made it go to two locations. So it's actually going to Ring, but it's also going to AWS. So while we were talking, I just copied another file, um, file nine. So let's hope the demo gods are not working against us. But uh, there we go. So that's in Ring. And then if I go to the um, S3 console. You see, it's not there now. Do a refresh. Yeah. Do a refresh. It's there. So actually, a little little adjustment to our slide, if you like. I hope the data from this, the quasi net app. I understand the metadata within XDM, but I actually sent the data to two places. I sent it to on-prem and I sent it to cloud. I just wanted to sort of show you. Look, it is multi-cloud. It's not just. I, we're touting our Ring product because we're very proud of it. But it really, it can sort of go anywhere, including Azure and anywhere else. And all the other cloud systems that we support. So I, I mentioned that we are adhering to the Amazon protocol for replication and lifecycle, yep. but we made an extension to go multi-way on replication. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so we can have multi, multiple targets. So this is customers say, look, I've got stuff on NetApp. I want to put it somewhere else on-prem that's cheaper, but actually I kind of want a DR copy in the cloud as well. And we, we have instances of that. OK, so uh, the second part of the demonstration, if you recall, um, uh, there was another thing I wanted to show, but I'll, I'll table it for now and come back to it, um, is that if we want to take data uh, from the ring and we want that data to go up to Azure, and there's, there's a reason I want to show you this. It's very specific, and I'll get to it. But So this is uh, a bucket within ring that's got uh, five, six objects in it. And if I then um, grab something else, what have I got in there? Apple Beach from field. Let's grab the mountains JPEG. So this is just using Cyberduck to copy data straight, straight to our ring. Okay, XDM is basically scanning our own ring to say, hey, has anything changed? So if I go back to the Senko Orbit browser and I go look at that bucket, uh, that's the that's the one I think. There's mountain. There it is at the bottom there. And again, it has uh, metadata associated to it. And what I might do is play with this metadata in a minute, but there's metadata in there. Um, that will have now been picked up and sent over to Azure. So if I go to the Azure browser, this is, this is that bucket or container within Azure. So if I refresh this, you should see mountain. There it is. The really key piece about this, which is why I wanted to show you this, is that I'm using the Azure browser. So one of the critical decisions we made at the development of the Zenko XDM product was to say, we're not going to containerize data that goes through it or is pulled from it or pulled through it into some proprietary format on the source, on the target system. So what XDM Zenko does is talks to native protocols to whichever is the, the target cloud system and converts it to that. So what this means is that customers who implement our solution and move data from cloud to cloud are not getting locked in by our solution. We're putting the data in its target native format. 
So what this means is customers who, so Microsoft has a very, very um, uh, uh, pe good pedigree in um, uh, imagery uh, analysis. So you could take, so our North London Football Club could take their images, use XDM to shove it to Azure, and then use the Azure image analysis tools on that data to then work out some kind of interesting things about their football footage. Because we're not putting it in, into Azure in a way that no one else can read it. We're putting it in in the native format. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to show you this. So, so that's true of all the clouds. So Chris, the, neg the negative side of that is that somebody could write something in sideways. And yes. The so there's a so there has to be an understanding that you don't go through the back door because we won't see the changes. Right. So what about things like when your software crashes or access to those clouds goes down because the vendors had a problem and then it comes back up again and there wasn't an ability to, to keep everything in sync? Is there a way to go back and highlight issues that have gone? You know, yeah, so you would tell XDM, okay, go rediscover. You know, just rediscover or, okay. or just you know, sync, basically. Yeah, but there's a, so there is like a, a rediscover yeah. process to fix it. Yeah, there is. I mean, it's not a button on the console, but yes, because yeah. you don't want to do that if you've got no, a petabyte. No, no, yeah. <laughs> what does this button do? Oh. Um, so uh, so that, was, that, was, that was essentially the demo that I wanted to show you. The other thing that I also wanted to just sort of throw in here um, is so if you think about the fact that on this demo, this NFS demo, I took NFS data and I shoved it to two different clouds. Uh, so now we're S3 aware and we use tools like Cyberduck and other S3 type products to see that data. Um, this helps customers migrate from a file system application to an S3 application, right? That's the challenge in the industry. There are still tools available that can look at an S3 system and present it back as a file system. So in this case, what I happen to have on my Mac, this is on my Mac, yeah, this is on my Mac, is, uh, is, um, is S3FS, which, or S3Fuse, which I'm sure any of you that fiddled around with technology know. So this is my Mac looking at the S3 instance. Uh, and, it, and ignore the writes, right? Because that's all POSIX writes that are, um, that are associated with my Mac. But, but essentially, the data that came from NFS went to an S3 cloud. and this. And S3FS could be pointed to Amazon or to our sing or no, seeing the same thing. So this data, even though it looks like a POSIX file system, is an S3 store. So now you start to sort of blur the lines between applications that speak <coughs> natively POSIX via NFS or SMB or whatever, and applications that can have that view of a POSIX view, but they're actually talking in the background to S3. So this is sort of a transformation technique. You, you look like you have how a <coughs> XDA finds data to move. Can I explain how it works? Yeah, can you say again how it finds data to move? So it depends on the source that it's talking to. If, we, if it's talking to our own ring system, we have some internal techniques to, to understand, uh, to, sw to sweep uh, cleverly and efficiently. I'm sorry, does it get told or does it find? Oh, it works on the time. Well, so if it's, if it's talking to, if XDM is sitting over a ring system, it works all the time. It just constantly. It's told. It, it's told, it's yeah. Told. There's a notification. There's an internal notification system. Okay. If, however, XDM is sitting over your classic kind of net app, then there's a sweeper cycle timer that runs that says, OK, go sweep the system. Can you not hook it to a lower level to get notification? We could. So, yeah. so that's the third bit I was about to say, which is, we, we said it just now, which is on the, the likes of an Isilon, and I think NetApp do it as well, and a few others, they have an API that, said that you can query that says, this is what changed in the time slice you're querying on. So as we, so we're at the beginning of this, so now we just say, look, we have an NFS mount, because pretty much any NAS can give us an NFS mount, including an Isilon and NetApp and everyone else. But our goal is to integrate more tightly to those systems and understand how to query them. So if we come up across an Isilon, for instance, we'll query their changelog API directly, and then we don't have to sweep. There'll be an initial sweep, probably at the beginning, but then after that, you just rely on the changelog. So that's you, all coming. Do you have any idea, ambitions about accepting streaming data into XDM? Um, so one thing to be aware is that this demo was all of what we would refer to as out of band sync. So I have a source and I'm moving it out of band to something else. So there's activity going on and I'm going to keep sweeping and moving. Zanko can w absolutely work in line. And I can show you this. because an S3 it. endpoint. So it can be an S3 endpoint. And when you talk to it 
directly, it behaves just like our Ring product. It has an S3 personality, and you can talk to it. It's actually exactly the same API code. So you can talk to it directly, and you can treat it like an S3 endpoint. And in that case, it can take on streaming data, whatever you throw at it. So it could be placed at an edge location where a lot of data has been generated. Correct. And, and that's back to that earlier slide, yes. Yeah, so, so we did have an opportunity, I think it was in Africa, where they had a lot of very kind of remote edge locations. Uh, and in there, we were talking about standing up a small 1U Zenko instance on a little localized NAS. And their local, you know, almost tribal systems would talk to the, uh, I think it was, uh, it was a telecoms provider, so they would have small data centers, right? And they would talk directly S3 to that Zenko edge point on the S3 API. Mm -hmm. And instead of it being an outer band movement to back to the core ring, it would talk directly back to the core ring. Okay, one step further. Yep. Ring is a file system as well as an object storage. It system. has two personalities, correct. Yeah. So could ring be executing at the edge? Um, our goal is not to try and squeeze ring to the edge. Uh, uh, and Brad's going to make a very interesting comment in a second. I knew he was going to do that. Uh, <laughs> as as we are squeezing it. Hold back. Edge. <laughs> so the ring, as it stands today, is something we see operating in a core data center mode or multi-data center like our famous London Football Club, which is three data centers. Most of our customers actually use this three-site metro topology. That's, they get resilience and they get performance. And nearly all of our media customers do that, and there's an example coming. Hospitals, yeah. But there is a, there is a change coming, and uh, that will absolutely change the way we position the ring uh, storage technology. <laughs> I have a feeling I know what so, you're saying. So, well, the, the, the next step storage backend uh, is, is technology you've been working on, and I think we've mentioned it in the past. Um, basically, ring is designed with a share nothing distributed protocol. The thinking was we have a system that can grow without bounds. Uh, in the early days, uh, a server, the first servers we deployed were two U servers with uh, 12 one terabyte drives, 12 terabytes in a, in a box. Today we have 60, 60, 20 terabyte drives for, to make it simple. 100. Some of them are 100. Yeah, um, but, but, but we're looking at almost a petabyte in a single box today. So we're starting to see very large systems that only need a very, very few servers. So we're, we're looking at a model where the data protection uh, is, is half of it is local to the server. So we have local repair codes mixed with network repair codes on a relatively static configuration. Um, and, and that's the, 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 the I, I hesitate to use the name. We call it hyperdrive. That's just an internal name. We can't use hyperdrive because that's, yeah. that's, been, that's been done. But, but uh, it, is, it is a high density, a high density. basically um, the, the closest thing, uh, Seagate came out with what they called Kinetic. Yes. Uh, and it was in a, a box that you had an, uh, an object API. So this is, it was a drive that had an object API. We thought the idea was interesting, so what we have is a, a box that has an object API. So that, and it does local repair codes inside the box. So you, and, and this technology uh, is going to be one of our paths forward also for full flash because we've, we've got a very fast stack. Uh, on, sorry, on this I didn't box. hear that last bit. Too. I'm sorry? I didn't hear that last section. It's going to be our path forward for full flash. But for flash? Right. And which particular flash is this flash? Is it TLC or are we going exciting? So we support flash today. In fact, that's the next section. Right. But I think Fred, Brad's talking about the high density the, QLC. The, the high yeah. density would most likely be QLC. And, and, and basically, it's, it's a, the, the way we write data is very similar to the way we do uh, files are containerized into big containers. Then, then they're erasure coded to protect the data locally. And then we have network. another layer up of network erasure coding that allows us to have high availability. So you get a matrix of, of orthogonally ratio codes and excellent durability uh, with your data for relatively low overhead. And we've got, um, we'll be coming forward with some results uh, on this whole new system. But that would, that's our strategy for the edge. You could put uh, a very small box on, on the edge with that technology. Again, the, 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 the API is, is, is very similar to what we have today, get, put, delete. When you say a very small box, what are you thinking about? Something smaller than a standard one reuse rack shelf? Oh, you are. We, don't, we don't see, I, I don't see the need quite for that. I mean, 
if you're getting smaller than, than something that's protecting itself at the edge with across, say, three servers, if you're getting smaller than that, what we're more lo looking at is, is tr more traditional um, protection at the edge and pushing a copy back to a central system. Yeah, I'm thinking about the box, yeah. the physical box. What kind of size? You said it's very small. What it can be. Small it, it can be anything. I, I'm thinking. I'm thinking one U, one U, one U kind of box. I mean, it, we've got. Um, you know, there's all kinds of exciting new stuff coming out, like the the. Um, uh, the small box is a one-year box with with, uh, with 32 rulers in it. Yeah, but, but we're still talking about a rack to hold it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not yeah. we're not table topping or anything. No, like we're that. we're not talking about the far edge on no, a telephone I, pole. I, I, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that okay. far edge, I'm thinking. Or even the data center under uh, yeah, the desk. But, yeah, but no. In yeah, a yeah, yeah. Enrico, so and then we'll take move about, ahead. Uh, a box that uh, has internal range coding, okay, and exposes some uh, S3-like uh, object storage APIs, and, yep. then, and then you have a, a network range coding mechanism to, yep. to, to protect the single box, okay, right. from the failure. So it doesn't mean that you are not storing the full object in the, in the, in the single box, but you are still keeping chunks and uh, you know, uh, right. because, because there is a, an issue now. If you if you are thinking about the double erasure coding mm -hmm. right. mechanism, yeah. So what uh, you're trying to avoid is a network access for a local disk failure yeah. rebuild. Yeah, that's that's what you're really trying to. So avoid. when we started this, and the servers were ten were ten drives in a one U, right? A rebuilding across the network for erasure codes was was reasonably fine. But now you've got a hundred drive units with twenty terabyte drives in them and you've got a petabyte and you have serious disk failures, pulling all that across the network starts to get poor. So we're going to have a sort of a double protection mechanism, you like. So, so disk drives can be healed within the server, but uh, more, more large-scale failures gets, get uh, recovered across the network. Okay. Yes, but then, then you have, you have a multiple, multiple you know, protection we do. Yeah, local erasure code meaning, in the network. Meaning also right. that you are... So it's less efficient from the... But well, it depends on your reduction. choice of erasure codes, and that's where the trick is. Sorry? Yeah. It depends on your choice of erasure codes, and that's where the trick is. But we, we can all has to move on. Well, but we'll we can talk about this. We'll do a briefing on the whole. Uh, we can do this at lunch if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, I'm going to move forward. We've got about 25, 30 minutes left and two more topics. I'm going to reserve time for Brad's demo. I do want to talk about what we're doing today for Flash support and then a little bit about what we're going into the future, and then we'll do, do Brad's demo. So ring performance. I want to talk about the real world. What's being deployed today, and what are people achieving uh, with the current ring architecture? The net of it is the current ring architecture scale out at all levels. Okay? As many underlying boxes as you want, the peer-to-peer -peer layer in the middle can distribute data across as many nodes as you select. And then what we call the interface layer that are called the connectors, as many endpoints as you want for file or object or both in a single system. Okay, so full scale out. Um, something that we know, because we've been doing this for 10 years, is that every ring that gets deployed actually uses Flash. Okay, so every ring that you deploy is actually two rings. It's a ring that is storing metadata, and that's always on Flash media. We've been doing that since the inception. Uh, and then we use the spinners, the hard disk drives, for the data. And the data lives in containers, fixed size containers. People call them boxcar files, but we're essentially packing the payload content into those containers so that we, we don't fracture the file system. Uh, typically, the metadata, it depends a lot on the average file size, but it's somewhere between a percent or two of the data size. Okay? So why do we use the flash? I think it's sort of intuitive. What we're really doing is serving as many requests as we can out of Flash. Okay? So this means file system operations, all the file system stat, directory listings, they respond out of Flash. Okay? There's no need to hit the spinners for those. Um, this is even file system um, you know, get attribute, set attribute type operations. The same for object. If you're doing a bucket listing operation or you're extending metadata, the user-defined metadata, it's all Flash. Uh, we went one step further, though, and that is that the index data, the thing that tells us where the containers are on disk and what the offsets are within the containers or the payloads, it's also stored on flash, and at runtime, that's cached in memory. Okay, so that's a, a memory access to get those things. So what we're really doing is saying only at the very end, if you want the data, do we do a parallel sequential I.O. To the, to the hard drives, okay? and that's for reads and writes. That's sort of the standard architecture that we always deploy. 
All right, so how does that translate today into performance? I'm going to talk about two of them. Uh, one is a, a streaming application that is using Splunk. Uh, and it's using Splunk to store log data at, at high volume. And then we'll talk specifically about the one that we have at Comcast for quite a while. All right, so this is the Splunk one that we kind of introduced at the beginning, that is using the file system for storing Splunk logs. Okay, the company here is a travel services company. Uh, their business problem at the top level is serving a huge number of travel availability searches. Okay, and it's a, an increasing problem. I think the number today is they serve a trillion availability searches per day, a trillion. Okay, and they see that increasing over time. Uh, they want to capture all of the log data of those searches and mine it. So they need to keep that online. Uh, the current uh, window of time that they're going to keep this for is 14 days. Okay? And what they generate is a petabyte per day of those logs, one petabyte. Okay? Uh, so what we did is we developed a cluster that is sized to uh, ingest that amount of data. Okay? And that means a sustained rate of 20 gigabytes per second over NFS uh, from 300 Splunk indexer nodes. Okay, so this runs all day, every day, running these ingests, but then pruning or deleting off the oldest data. Right? So it's a very ingest, but also high churn type of workload. And we've seen peaks at 65 gigabytes. Yeah, so we've seen peaks over 60 gig, but I guess the, the petabyte per second rate is, is sort of the sustained one. Okay? Uh, we are validated with Smart Store, but I think this kind of explains why Smart Store wasn't the right use case for, or this wasn't the right use case for it. That is more of a tiering, right? I have hot and, and warm data. This is pure ingest on a, on a sustained basis. Okay, so that is the use case that we're doing today in production with this company. Uh, they have others. Uh, others are things like uh, boarding passes. I need to go to a kiosk and I need to check in. It's serving the PDFs for the boarding passes uh, directly out of the ring. And then they have plans with Zenko for uh, distribution to the cloud, okay? So the performance one, again, is this, this Splunk one. This tends to be a very common conversation we're having with a lot of customers these days as well. Just to kind of give you a sense for where we could get an improvement if we go all flash, okay? Think about the ring, and I know this is a kind of a low-level diagram, but think about the ring as essentially operating on three different operations. We have to find the object, which is really an operation to find the key in the peer-to-peer -peer system, okay? If you have a thousand node cluster, which is large, uh, you would have three network hops to find the key, max, okay? So find that, finding that key in three hops is about 0.3 milliseconds, okay? Uh, then we have that transaction to actually find the actual store node that has the object. Well, that's the in-memory piece. That's that index data. Uh, since that's in memory, that's super fast. It's 0.1 millisecond, okay? And then ultimately, now getting the content. If you really want the content, if you're going after a hard drive, you have hard drive latency, 10 milliseconds. If you put that on flash, you get a huge benefit, right? So there is a point here where if you have a disk data intensive workload, you're gonna benefit from, 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 uh, from flash. Okay, so what's the path forward? Uh, well, ultimately today we support flash. Okay, we support it as, as we've talked about here. Do we have full flash deployments? We do, we've had them for years. Uh, in fact, where it's used is today in content serving applications where they just wanna get ultimate performance. Uh, so media content serving, okay? This has been running at least since 2018. Uh, newer conversations now are about live TV, okay? This is where they need super deterministic latency. You can't have spikes. Uh, things need to be sort of bounded for every operation, okay? What about this high density stuff that's coming at us, TLC, QLC? We're testing it right now, okay? Uh, so that's in partner labs. Uh, some of the hardware that we're gonna target is, is being readied. Where will it help, right? This is really where we're putting a lot of thought. We don't want to put this out if there's no use case for it. Um, the live TV is coming at us, so that's one uh, certain pocket. Uh, today we do the medical imaging really for archives, right? But they have a tier one need as well, where you're really delivering the images right to the doctor. This can come into play. Uh, we now have a customer doing financial fraud detection. Okay, so it's a very high performance intensive analytics workload. They could benefit ultimately from all flash if they have to go get small uh, payloads all the time. And then on the backup side, we are the backup target for all of these different apps. Uh, but if you have a mission critical, super fast restore, like say the last week of data, this could help. Okay? Uh, so that's why we wanna kind of take this to the last mile. But is it supported today? It's supported today. We need to get to that 
sort of last mile of testing. All right. Um, quick, quick Chris. About, um, yeah. In terms of capacity and size and, and how much you're putting in flash and how much you're putting in DRAM, um, <coughs> based on the size of um, number of objects, metadata size, right. how would you have to size that system as you were building it out? Because you know, there's a certain amount of that metadata you're keeping, and the ability to do all those lookups in either DRAM or flash must mean that your system needs to be balanced a certain way in terms of design. Yeah, yeah so, so we have sizing tools. So you know, we clearly we don't just sort of sell a box and go, there you go, Mr. Customer. Every single sale is a conversation. And part of that conversation is to figure out what's their average object size, what's their upper and lower bound, how many objects are we going to store in a, you know, a, a 45, 10, six of them or whatever. So we have algorithms to tell us this is how much metadata space we need, and therefore this is this sizes are. Which is fine when you're building a new system, but when you've built one that's been in use since 2010 and yeah. it's got a mixture of all sorts of different technologies, does that not pose a risk that you have to sometimes replace or extend nodes that might not still meet that requirement or does the system sort of rebalance around it rebalances we rebalance it yeah yeah and typically what we're seeing and i mean i i was at comcast i was a, one of the architects at comcast when when this was delivered uh and this was you know a very older generation set of hardware that is now well gone from the system but as paul mentioned you know we've evolved those those hardware models with them over time and so there is always a balance of, okay, so this new server is a little bit more capable than these older servers, so you're not going to see all the benefit of these newer servers until the older servers are kind of off the network. But essentially the way that expansions work is you apply new servers and you balance off of the old servers onto the new hardware, and then when the old ones are gone, you just power them off and off you, you have go. Any auto performance tuning that does that for you, and how do things like Optane then shift this mix? So I don't know about Optane, but the the way that we uh, the way that we schedule the data movement is we can put limits on the amount of data that gets moved at any particular. So we can throttle the data movement up and down but so you that don't we do don't affect performance. Sort of performance oriented data and performance no, tiers, etc. No, within no, it's sort of a know, flat spectrum. Like a OS, you mean within the within yeah. Yeah. a bit like that, but more just understanding yeah. not just the hot data, but performance sensitive data, et cetera, and making sure it's in the right place, et cetera. Right. I, I think the tiering is really across systems, right? So you could have a ring that's a certain quality of storage and another ring, and then we'd apply lifecycle management to that. Yeah. And, and our goal is to always maintain the level of service. So we're not really sort of mucking around with uh, putting hot data in a certain place. We just want to make sure that we're, op we're, we're providing the consistent level of service as we grow off these, grow these servers out. So we just try to keep everything as simple as we can. Okay. And it's, a, it's always a balance. I mean, when you, when you do tiering, um, you. You, you double the numbers of reads and writes globally on your system when you move data from a hot to a cold tier. So if we can have a giant lukewarm tier that works for everybody, it, it reduces the number of IOs significantly. And you double the number of read writes on a system like that Comcast one, and those numbers start getting really scary. And our customers look for consistent service delivery rather than sort of clever mechanics quite often. They just want to make sure the system stays up throughout, you know, through fairly big evolutions of, of systems. I mean, 115 servers, that's, that's quite a system. But then you get silos. So people manually silo because it's simple, but it's not very <coughs> Yeah, and our goal is to not silo, so. <coughs> Okay, the last section here is a little bit looking forward, uh, some of the innovations. We couldn't highlight all the things we're doing. We, we mentioned the high density server uh, data protection architecture, that's not covered today. Uh, we have a workflow engine for more advanced policies beyond replication and lifecycle that introduces the Lambda function support. The ones that we were gonna cover today was the new UI that unifies on cloud and on, uh, cloud and on premise. I think given the amount of time available, I'd like to focus on the last one, okay? The um, cloud file system. So the only thing I'll say then about the next gen UI is the following, 15 minutes. Thank you, Fred. Okay, we, we really needed to solve a UI challenge, and that is multi-cloud data management through a single pane. But really just in general, how can we make this whole SDS management equation easier, okay? The, the nice thing is to be able to leverage your customer knowledge, right? And we do feel that we have a real valuable asset here in the customer base. We have hundreds of Comcast class customers, right, that really know what they're doing and can tell us, right, what, how to make this better. Uh, they're super busy, they're selective with their time. We embarked on a, essentially a year-long project where we employed a usability firm and asked them to extract the knowledge of what people want, okay? 
And what came out of this was really a couple of observations. One is they want a single UI, excuse me, over multiple rings and multiple clouds. Um, we have a bank that has 10 rings globally. Okay, so they'd like to be able to have a single namespace across that. Uh, moreover, as we're starting to see more enterprise accounts, you get the generalists, right? They want click, click, done, okay? So those are things that stood out. Uh, this U new UI encompasses that knowledge, but ultimately it's all about providing this sort of single pane across multiple rings, multiple clouds, the new architecture that we're coming out with, and even the third-party NAS and object storage. So uh, that's kind of the net of the project. Okay, um, so with that, let's move to Brad's section since we're probably down to 12 minutes or so. I just ask a quick question yeah. about performance. Am I naive, but is some um, performance in terms of heat, in terms of resources, in terms of electricity, yeah. something that's uh, are you not mentioning it because it's not relevant or because it's being covered somewhere else? Performance density, you're talking about in heat and thermals? Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. We had a conversation about it last night at dinner. Um, there were some anecdotes that going to all flash would be more green and, and save on power. It does not. They're actually more consumptive. Uh, but on the other hand, you get more performance out of a unit, right? So it's potential that it can still save in the <coughs> Some of the very biggest considerations are actually hitting the limits of what the local electricity can supply. They are, um, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're actually, Brad, Brad knows this, we're seeing some customers that want to do oil cooling yeah. on their data center equipment, so those are the kind of things that we're hearing. So those are going to be, yeah. those are an issue. They yeah. are. They're, yeah, we have a deployment right now that's doing an oil, oil dip. In some sense, maybe our contribution to the problem is to be able to use these really, really large, increasingly slow, i.e. IOPS and, and throughput per, per terabyte drives. Uh, to keep providing uh, reliable services. And that's in probably the most amazing thing about Comcast is being able to use f big fat drives for a high IOPS solution. And I think that's, in a sense, one of our contributions to the problem. Rather, rather not having to go to, to, to very high IO small drives. And in traditionally, email uh, people use very small drives to meet the IOPS, and this is spreading the load out over 4,000 drives uh, makes a big difference. And, and mid-grade SATA drives. And, yeah. Do you know if Comcast is looking at shingled media? <laughs> the, you know that they look at everything, right? Um, we've we've done a little bit of messing around with shingled. It's SMR. SMR, yeah. It's yeah. very very hard to use. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Our, our experience with shingled was was sad up to now. So we'll sad. <laughs> performance is quite different. Yeah, the, the performance the is quite different. We, we, in theory, we have a good model because we, we write big files and then we overwrite big files. But for content delivery, it's if it. If the content is relatively static, uh, it works pretty well. Email is anything but static. We're looking at a platform like that. You're looking at in the range of 10 to 20% of the whole platform being rewritten uh, every week. 